Hi, so this lecture will be on existentialism. Uh, and I'll mostly be talking about Jean-Paul Sartre, a, a famous existentialist, but I'll talk about others as well. Uh, but first, some context. So uh, existentialism emerges in the 1800s, and it's on the back of um, the philosopher George Hegel uh, and a sort of uh, idealist movement that he inspired, which included um, Karl Marx. Hegel saw history as moving in a direction uh, towards it increasing freedom uh, and increasing reason. And the way he saw uh, history unfolding was that a theory would emerge, a thesis. Uh, and the thesis would have an inherent flaw within it, uh, a problem. Uh, so if you took the thesis seriously, uh, you, you would end up coming to an unresolvable issue which would give rise to an antithesis, a counterpoint of view, okay? Uh, and it had an inherent flaw within it. Uh, so, uh, you know, what would emerge from there is a synthesis. Uh, so, and that would, you know, resolve the issues uh, of the thesis and the antithesis. So a great example is the rationalism and empiricism Pierce, debate that we looked at. Uh, Descartes, um, you know, was the rationalist, uh, you know, and, and thought that the senses were flawed and we couldn't, you know, gain any knowledge from them. Uh, but then the empiricists, they recognize uh, that you need the senses to build any sort of theory of knowledge. In fact, the senses are what Descartes started with in order to, uh, you know, get any traction on his meditations at all. Uh, and then from there, we get a synthesis in, in uh, Immanuel Kant, who recognizes that the mind is not a blank slate. It comes with categories of experience. Uh, but at the same time, you need experience in order to have knowledge. So he took, you know, the, you know, ideas from the rationalist camp and ideas from the empiricist camp and created a synthesis. And it has its own flaws uh, within it. So, you know, it ends up giving rise to an antithesis, uh, which gives rise to a, a new synthesis. And Hegel saw history moving in this direction, uh, the direction of progress, okay? Things just keep getting better and better. And Karl Marx was a Hegelian early on, writing in, from his philosophy, and as we saw, uh, the new economic relations come about necessarily uh, because the, you know the you know the the economic relations make possible some technological innovation that creates the very undoing of that prior economic system and gives rise to a new one and so he saw communism as a necessary final step in, in human history where people finally become free uh, but that is history unfolding itself in, in a necessary way. Uh, and, and so this we can think of as big system philosophy. And what is lost in these big system philosophies that were all the rage at the time, what's lost in them? The individual, the, you know, the person, uh, you know, for Hegel, people start to look a lot like pawns, you know, that are being sort of forced uh, towards, you know, in the direction of reason and freedom uh, by uh, what Hegel calls spirit. And for Marx, people sort of become, uh, you know, it's all about the emancipation of the person, but individual persons uh, in history are sort of being pushed by, um, you know, economic relations that are outside of uh, their direct control. Uh, so, you know, people are sort of uh, lost in this big system philosophy. And so existentialism is largely a reaction to that because existentialism is fundamentally about the individual and the individual experience. As you know, the existentialists were really sort of rebels, uh, the early ones that they didn't label themselves as existentialists. And um, they also didn't create some kind of overarching, you know, theory that uh, was supposed to capture the truth. So Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, often considered the, the first existentialist, at least of the modern existentialist tradition. He wrote in pseudonyms 
uh, he, he used the names, uh, for instance, Anticlimachus was one of his uh, names. And he would write, um, you know, philosophical treatises, uh, and they would often contradict each other. So one, you know, writer under one pseudonym uh, writes one thing, and then another writes something that's totally contradictory. Uh, and that's because Kierkegaard was primarily concerned with getting people to just think, you know, about their experience and, and about who they are uh, as a person. And he certainly rebelled against any, uh, you know, sort of top-down uh, way of thinking. Uh, he was a Christian whose philosophy can largely be regarded as an attack on Christian dumb. Okay, and Christian dumb uh, would be any sort of Christianity that makes sense to a person. You know, it's packaged in some kind of deal uh, that is easily digestible. Okay, uh, thinking about Kierkegaard, he, he talked about these modes, uh, these existential uh, modes, okay? Uh, and one of them is the aesthetic. And that is where someone is 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 very free and very creative and not very serious. Uh, so we think of the artist who's sort of um, experimenting with, uh, you know, different uh, art forms and so on, uh, and, and doesn't really have any structure um, or way that they ought to be. Uh, they're sort of, it's free expression, okay? And then there's the ethical realm. And in the ethical realm, things make sense. We're not talking about simply right and wrong. Uh, the ethical realm involves any sort of thing where the, the creativity is lost from the aesthetic level and a seriousness uh, is, you know, is comes down on a person. Uh, so, uh, you know, Christian dumb. Uh, falls under this, the ethical realm. And that would be sort of organized um, tradition uh, where there's sort of a preacher or a leader uh, and people uh, look to that leader for answers, okay? And then the answers are given to them. And Christianity is sort of made easy in a way, okay? And then for Kierkegaard, uh, the top layer here is the religious. And it's a realm of fear and trembling, okay? Uh, and when someone is in the religious realm, they can't make sense of, of their experience. You know, to, they can't help make sense of it to someone else because it's so personal. Uh, so he uses as his example, Abraham, because uh, in the Old Testament, Abraham is asked by God to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Okay. And Abraham can't tell his wife he's thinking of killing his own son. He loves his son more than anyone in the world. Uh, and so it, it's just absurd for him to, to kill his son. Uh, God doesn't explain to him why he should kill his son. It's not like, you know, a thousand lives will be saved if you kill your son. That would that would be a, a, a sort of a, a, an experience that would make sense if, if there was some kind of utilitarian uh, reason for it. It was absurd that, you know, that Abraham was asked to do this. Uh, and so Kierkegaard challenges us uh, to not think about it in the aftermath because what happened is Abraham decided to do it and takes his son up this mountain and then God changes his mind, says, oh, you've, you've proven yourself, your faith, you don't have to kill your son. No, Kierkegaard says, imagine being there, walking your son up that mountain, and you don't know that you, this whole thing's going to be called off. Uh, that is the religious realm where there's no way to make sense of it. It's a completely individual uh, decision that you have to make. In Abraham's case, do I, you know, do I take seriously the rule that thou shalt not kill and, and defy the will of God? Uh, or do I, you know, act on my faith and do what God is asking me to do? Uh, there, you know, I'm torn between uh, these selves, you know, and I have to take a leap of faith. And, and Kierkegaard says it should be in fear and trembling. You know, Abraham risks everything. Uh, he, he might be hallucinating. He might be completely wrong uh, that God is speaking to him and asking him to do this. He has to take that, you know, leap 
uh, and decide what he's going to do. Okay, so Kierkegaard, uh, you know, talks about the religious realm as one that doesn't make sense. And Kierkegaard uh, said in the last year of his life, um, you know, as strong a Christian as he was, he said he dares not call himself a Christian. If you have, if you can call yourself a Christian, uh, you know, you don't take seriously the in the the seriousness and you know the the intensity of of that calling, according to him. Uh, okay, Jean Paul Sartre, where many philosophers, uh, existentialist philosophers, avoided the term. Jean-Paul Sartre did try to uh, create an official sort of uh, philosophy uh, of existentialism. And so what I want to talk to you about is his famous line that says, existence precedes essence. And we can make sense of this phrase by thinking about the opposite, something whose essence precedes its existence. And so you can think about a tool. You know, imagine uh, the first hammer that's ever been created. Well, someone saw a need for hammering nails and had a vision and thought up the hammer before finding the raw materials and building it. So a tool is an example of the essence preceding the existence. There is an ideal hammer that exists as an ideal that makes the physical hammer a good one or a bad one. A good hammer, uh, you know, achieves what the ideal has set out for it. A bad hammer doesn't. Maybe it, you know, doesn't successfully drive the nails. Uh, well, for a human being, Jean-Paul Sartre says that existence precedes essence. That first you get a person thrown into a world, thrown into circumstances, uh, and then they have to invent and create and choose and you know they are in charge of uh, their essence there's no right or wrong way to be a human being uh, you find yourself in a world and you decide and you choose and you invent who you are and who you ought to be okay now with that uh, comes an incredible amount of responsibility Sartre argues that you are not only responsible for yourself, but you're responsible for all people and all dogs, perhaps. Here's our dog again. Um, so, now that doesn't mean that I'm literally responsible for you, like I'm not responsible for you watching this video or doing your homework or anything like that. Only you are. But when you take your responsibility seriously, according to Sartre, Everything that you do, every thought you have, every decision you make, you take responsibility when you hold it up as a model for how all ought to think, how all ought to act, okay? So if you do your homework, you're making a statement to the world that anyone in your position, uh, with your circumstances, ought to do their homework, okay? Uh, and if you go out and feed the homeless, you're taking a position that everyone, in the world who's living with your circumstances in your position ought to be feeding the homeless if you imagine how your life would change if you accepted that level of responsibility where you saw yourself as as projecting a model for all humankind okay that's the kind of responsibility that jean paul sartre is talking about and with it comes a host of unhappy feelings including anguish, okay? Because we, we start to anguish about our decisions when we accept that level of responsibility, the same way that Abraham would anguish over the decision to, uh, to you know, kill his son or not. Uh, now, that's a very extreme example, but, uh, you know, anytime you accept full responsibility for who you are, uh, you are not blaming anyone else. Are you not blaming, you know, a, a mental state or a psychological um, issue? You are taking full responsibility, then you start to feel anguished because you realize that you're free to do any number of things at any point, uh, you know, in time, okay? All right, uh, and I will um, provide some more um, 
notes in the module about Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy.